Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. My name is Kimir Baker. I am an overcomer. I am very passionate about helping others to achieve an abundant life fueled by spiritual principles and emotional balance. In this podcast series, we delve into spiritual self-care. Yes, we will explore exercising our minds and bodies, but more importantly, we will discuss strengthening our inner being, embracing God's love, and being filled by the fullness of God. As you take this journey with us, we want to inspire possessing your authentic selves and happiness. Glad to have you back. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. I don't know about you, but sometimes we just need to hear that God is with us during these tough times. Not only is he with us, but he is still working on our behalf. He is in the supplying your needs business. In last week's episode, we highlighted more specifically him supplying Christ through tough situations. Well, as I stated previously, we have a great show for you today. We're not only going to talk about Paul in a little bit more detail, but God's deliverance, but also with us being locked up due to the pandemic, how in the world do we work through our adjusted lifestyle and dealing with ourselves? So yes, we are going to talk about it. And as I stated before, I love having friends come on the show and share their insights. And the person that's here today with me, I'm actually really just excited to have. She's been very influential in my life for the past couple of years. And sometimes she actually makes it on the show, not knowing she's on the show because of all her wisdom and the great things that she exudes. It comes out. So without further ado, Sindhu. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kamir. I am so excited to be with you today. Well, I'm excited to have you. And as I said before, we're going to talk about some good stuff. But before we get started, can you please let people know who you are? Okay, well, I'd love to do that. I am originally from India. I am a missionary kid. My parents were still are missionaries in India, Bible translators to be specific, Wycliffe, India. And so I came to the U.S. in 2007 to pursue my master's in biblical counseling, which by God's grace, I was able to complete in 2009. And soon after, married the love of my life, Robert Jefferson. And together we have Luke. He is our extroverted six and a half year old. And I am also mom to Nat the cat, 13 years old, and eight week old Gracie, our Aussie puppy. So that is a little about me and my family. Oh, that's pretty neat. And I I like the fact that you decided to do counseling. So, what attracted you to counseling? Well, so I pretty much grew up around family and and Christian community. And it came from a lot of the feedback that I was getting about how they noticed that I was a good listener. And I absolutely loved encouraging people. So I think that had a lot to do with it. And of course, there was a lot of ups and downs and twisty roads in between. But I truly believe that it was the grace of God that finally took me to the exact path which I'm on today. Sindhu is here because we're talking about God's provisions. We were talking about Philippians. And for you guys who are listening, actually this concept, this idea of really looking into Philippians, really looking to Paul and who he's about, is actually Sindhu's idea. So I said, well, Sindhu, since this is your idea, you should come and talk about it. So can you give us some Read some background information to what inspires you of Philippians and why you wanted to talk about Philippians. I am just amazed how this book written 
so long ago, right, speaks to us, uh, speaks to the very heart of what we are going through today, here and now. It is a word for every season. It's the word of life, right? So what I believe, and I know that our time together will be just scratching the surface of this. And so I really encourage our listeners to go back and dig and meditate and chew on these words for yourself. But what I have been able to draw from this is that Paul had a very deep conviction that he belonged to Christ, that he was there by God's design, that God not only began a good work in him, but that God would see it through to the end, not just for him, but for the church of Philippi. And the same for you and me today, you know, that we belong to him. We are his and he is ours and he's got a purpose for us. And that's why we're here today in, in even in the midst of a rather overwhelming and scary time in our lives. And finally, that he will accomplish his purposes in us. And to, to that end, one of the words that really jumps out at me is actually in the very first verse of chapter one. And Paul is, as he normally does in his greeting, introducing himself. And the way he does it time and again is by referring to himself as bond servant. And the Greek word for that is doulos. And what that is referring to is back in the day when slavery was legal, it was, it was there, it existed, somebody who had earned their way out of slavery because they had paid their dues, they had done their time, and they were really legally allowed to go free. But in these cases, they loved their master so much that they voluntarily would choose to remain with their master and serve them to the end of their days. So right there, that word bondservant, Paul refers to himself that way. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, Jesus is also referred to as a bondservant in chapter 2, verses 7. And if, you, if you'd like to read it through verse 11, both Jesus and Paul refer to them. And that right there is identity. I belong to a loving, heavenly father, and I live to serve him. So that was Paul's life mission. Christ was what he talked and ate and dreamt about, whether in chains or whether he was free. So that's one thing I really wanted to highlight for us about Paul. His identity was completely centered around Christ. Secondly, Paul goes um, in detail in chapter 3 and starts listing out this whole list of qualifications. And sometimes, you know, especially when I was a little younger, I, Paul got on my nerves a bit, you know, it's like, this guy, he brags, you know, he's a, <laughs> he can tend to brag a bit, but even behind the bragging, right, there was a point he was trying to make. And he says, I count all of this as rubbish. All these amazing qualifications, like, if we were to talk about in the modern day, right? I went to Harvard and, you know, I have a double PhD and da da da, well, you know, all of that stuff. And he says, all of that I would consider as pure rubbish, right? For the joy and the knowledge of knowing Christ. That would be my second point in terms of how. Paul kind of saw his life. I will say though, like the thing that that stood out to me the most in what you were sharing was the fact that he knew that he belonged to a loving heavenly father 
And that response to that belonging was to serve him and his identity was centered. Mm-hmm. And I know recently for me, God has been taking me through this journey where I'm learning how to make sure that I'm receiving him in my journey, that he is in my journey, that we're walking this journey together, that I'm holding his hand, that I'm being willing to hold his hand instead of me running off because I have a tendency just to run off because I I think I, I know things a certain way. But there's another word that you use where I think is so tender in terms of his understanding was the mere fact that he was able to relate to God as a loving father. And I know so many times through our circumstances, it's difficult to see God being loving because we're enduring hard times. We're enduring pain. But I really did enjoy hearing that connection that his identity was in Christ and in God because he knew how loving he was and he knew that he had great provision for him. And so his actions mimic that understanding. And so I kind of want to go into a little bit more detail because one of the things that I sort of alluded to, so if I didn't, here it is, I'm just going to say it and drop it out, is that somehow too, Even though he was imprisoned, he was still able to have hope and joy and call other people to it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I I think that that flows from his identity. You can't share, you can't give what you don't have. This apostle, he was anchored. I mean, his very... Life was anchored and centered. His whole identity was wrapped up in Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus. And so as a natural overflow of that is the joy that he experienced. Christian joy, sometimes it's easier to describe what something is by starting off with what it's not. Let me tell you, what Christian joy isn't. It is not a positive emotion that depends on favorable circumstances of the moment. You got to remember this old apostle, okay? Because at this moment in time, it's not like he's a spring chicken, right? He's, he's an older man and he is in chains and he is talking about joy and he's talking about rejoicing And he is in chains. So Christian joy is not a positive emotion that depends on me having that job promotion or having that that life partner that I've been praying for. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are all good gifts from the Lord. They are to be celebrated and they are wonderful answers to prayers. But This type of Christian joy that we are referring to, specifically within the book of Philippians, it's it's coming from a very, very deep place where I have nothing but him. And I realize that I have all I need. When we are stripped of everything, help and finances, and even, let's say, rest at night, He is that place. He is that soft place that I can lean into and receive strength and receive joy. So what it is, is a deep conviction that I am his and he is mine. Going back to identity. It is believing that what I am experiencing right now, right here, even 2020 did not catch God by surprise. It is believing that he is actively at work in my life right now, even in the midst of being laid off, even in the midst of family, friends falling ill, or, you know, whatever the trial may be knowing that even though I cannot see with my eyes, I know that I know that I know 
because of Jesus, I know without a doubt that if he did not spare his only son for me, that he can work this out and he will. He will. So that's the kind of determined resting. I, I really like a uh, think of joy in that way. Kind of, you know, it's not a passive sitting in my rocking chair waiting for the weather to change in Texas. It is an active posture. It is a determined resting in his love for me. So that's Christian joy. I'm la- I'm chuckling a little bit because that was so powerful and it kind of it kind of took me off guard a little bit because you've honed in the to the essence of who we are in him and you've honed in in terms of as well resting in him and i love also too there has to be a conviction about it and so many times when circumstances are happening we go up and down we fluctuate we fluctuate mm-hmm. tomorrow maybe i'll be a little bit more confident in in who he is for me but I think what you shared is so key because it is calling us back to no matter what is going on in those ups and downs, that there still is a conviction that I will rest in him, that I will allow him to work through my circumstances, and I believe in what he's going to do for me. Absolutely, Camille. And, and you know, if I can just insert something in there. Not every day is a woohoo, you know, hallelujah, I am walking in his word. Not every day feels like that. And and I really appreciate the fact that the book of Philippians talks about the fact that we are in process. Uh, The the reference in uh, chapter one to God continuing his good work in us till the end. And then again, Paul in chapter three, verse 12 talking about, but I haven't already attained. I mean, here's this, this I mean, the superhero uh, of our spiritual faith. He says, but even I haven't already attained, nor am I already perfect, but mm-hmm. I press on. I just want to reiterate something that you mentioned in your earlier segment. This is not to shame us in any way or to tell us that, gosh, I better be better than this, but it's to, again, encourage us to keep going every day, step by step. And within that keep going step by step, can you provide like some practical things that we can do to hone on or to not hone, but to be able to keep that journey, that that walking? So I want to, again, circle back around to identity. I can't stress enough that you can read every self-help book. You can be going to your counselor every day of the week, right? You can be doing every single thing, but if you are not anchored in Christ, if you do not know who you belong to, then everything else I'm going to talk about here on out will fall by the wayside. So this is like the foundation. The identity part is the absolute foundation. Well, I do believe that was a drop to my statement. So thank you for all that you've shared. And I'm not going to add to that. That was just wonderful. I want to see how do we begin that journey of getting reconnected? And then what happens if we're not in that connection mode? Okay, well, I do believe that we all have only 24 hours in a day. So there are things that we need to take a stock, and our daily schedule is one of those. As a culture, as a community in general, we are about nonstop going at 100 miles an hour. And when I look at the Bible, I see a God who models rest. I mean, why does the God of the universe, who by his very word, he creates something from nothing, right? And he breathes life into dust. Why would a God 
who is as powerful as that rest on the seventh day. And I, I strongly believe that the Bible is full of models that he provides because he is trying to set an example for us. And so, you know, when we look at our schedules and they're so packed and they're so full, consider what can I maybe take off my schedule so that I can reach out to a brother, to a sister, to a family member, or, you know, maybe it's people within your own household. You know, how can I maybe turn the news off and just sit outside on the patio with my kids? Mm -hmm. It's really about, again, looking to cut back, or like I often say to my clients, in order to say yes, we have to say no. You need to practice to saying no a little bit more so that we can say yes to the things that are truly beneficial and life-giving, like relationships and connection. So that would be definitely one thing to help in really reconnecting. And you were asking me, Kamir, about some other things to kind of help during these times. I'd like to talk about, having spoken about rest, other self-care methods. One thing that I like to repeat is exercise your mind and exercise your body. In this time when a lot of us are confined, we need to be more intentional about switching off our TVs, our social media, and all these background noises and really exercising our mind. And we can do that by, again, healthy conversations, meaningful conversations, by reading for fun or for learning, and then moving, move your body. Believe it or not, just sitting in one place for hours on end is not good for your body. Your body is going to be more forgiving if you are younger. But once you get into your 30s and 40s, believe me, your body's going to start talking back at you. We were just, we were not created to sit and not move. Our bodies were meant for movement. And so those are a few ways that we can practice self-care. I kind of want to bring up a little bit because when you were talking about rest and, and connection being very key for this season or in general for our well-being, I want to add, though, because something that I know in my own life and someone keeps telling me over and over again, especially the value of resting, is what happens when I'm not in that mode, when I'm not able to spend my time decompressing, sleeping or or spending time meditating him or, or spending time connecting with others, I know for myself, one of the things that happens is I kind of lose my mind a little bit from an emotional standpoint. And I began to be filled a little bit more with anxiety because I, I'm not in a position where I'm at peace. And so what I would love because of what you do is perhaps you can give us some practical methods besides resting and connecting to how we can handle our anxiety in a healthier manner. Yes, absolutely. Philippians 2.14 talks all about it, up to verse 16, about dealing with anxiety. But a very practical way to handle that is what I like to call putting boundaries on your anxiety. First of all, I'd like to start off by telling you that your symptoms of anxiety are not your enemies. People tend to kind of experience various symptoms because they haven't cared for themselves, because they haven't connected with God and with others in a, in a, a healthy and meaningful way. And so they develop a lifestyle of anxiety. I have to stress that anxiety very easily becomes a lifestyle. But in and of itself, the symptoms of anxiety are simply messengers 
It's your body trying to tell you, hey, wake up. I am not doing good. We are not doing good. You need to take care of us. If you simply medicate your symptoms, it may disappear for a while, but the root problem remains. If I may take a minute here to share an anecdote, you know, when we had our baby, he's six and a half, still calling my baby, but when he was born, as parents, we were very anxious when that temperature would go up. It's 100 and 102. The instruction that we were given was to not medicate his fever until it had reached a certain temperature. And by human logic, to me at least, I thought, why should I not give him some Tylenol when his fever is 101? And what I was told is that the body is raising its temperature to fight the mm-hmm. virus. If I medicate the fever, I'm just really medicating the symptom and the body is really fighting this virus. Anxiety in and of itself is not your enemy. If you would pay attention to it and would take the opportunity for some self-reflection and try to figure out, okay, what really is going on with me? What is my anger telling me that I need to address? What is my anxiety telling me to address? In that way, you use your emotional symptoms to course correct. But going back to this exercise on emotional boundaries with your anxiety, what I recommend is, you know, this exercise where every day you have a time during the day, preferably in the middle of the day, you sit down and you take a piece of paper and you write out everything that you are anxious about Mm. and just write them all and then when you're done you tear it up and as a believer i would you know encourage you with philippians 2 14 uh, offer that list as prayer requests before the lord and then you throw it away and you're done for the day and so as you go through your day and an anxious thought comes up you're going to tell your anxious thought, okay, and no, you're not crazy for talking to yourself. David did it all the time in the book of Psalms. And you will tell that anxious thought, hey, you had your time from 12 to 12.15. Now you're going to have to wait for tomorrow, 12 o'clock. Go and, you know, hang out on the couch. This is a sort of internal dialogue or self-talk that you are engaging in And in doing so, what you are doing is putting emotional boundaries to your anxiety. Mm. So, yeah, that would be a technique or a tool that you could use. I definitely appreciate that because I know for me, when I get in my emotional state, I can just chew on it and chew on it and chew on it until I'm so exhausted I can't do anything else. So the mere fact of hearing you say emotional boundaries and to be able to have a practical technique to get to that place, I'm grateful. <laughs> so, Absolutely. No, I, I do want to add, I do want to add, Kamir, that the reason I said try to make it sometime during the middle of the day is, and that's very convenient because most of us, Take lunch breaks, and if you don't, then, hey, you need to re-examine your self-care. But the reason why I say middle of the day versus evening is because when we start to come to the end of the day, we don't want to really rehash or dwell uh, because we're trying to unwind. Take care of this sort of business earlier on in the day so that you don't carry it in, especially through the evening or into your sleep at night. I definitely appreciate that. And I believe just the things that you've presented in terms of managing anxiety, in terms of rest and connection and and being in Christ in that way as well, are all facets to maintaining our hope and joy and being able to not be on that roller coaster sort of of life circumstances And then especially with this anxiety piece, I think it's so imperative to be able to have something that we can 
say, okay, I know I'm enduring life and it happens, but how can I practically move forward in this circumstance and not lose my mind? <laughs> yes. It's really, in and of itself, anxiety has become a pandemic, not just COVID. In this year, there has been such an uptick of anxiety and depression. And so people like me, fortunately, really have a lot of work for us. So, You've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because with what is going on in the country and around the world, anxiety is definitely the kind of the new pandemic that we are having to deal with. It definitely makes sense because we're at a place where things are beyond our control and just learning how to place or be acknowledging that God still is in control. I do want to, before we end, mention uh, two more things, if I may, if we have the time for it. Go for it. You know, uh, one is based off of Philippians 4, verse 8, which I'm going to read for us in a minute. But what I want to encourage our listeners is watch what you feed your mind. What you feed your mind is what it will feed on. Philippians 4, 8 talks about, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. So again, I, I really encourage us to watch what we feed our minds. What we feed it will be what it feeds on and what it exudes, what it releases. And finally, from Philippians 4, verse 9, I think that that would be such a great way to end this time. Paul exhorts us, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So again, Paul is saying, look at me, watch me, see how I do it, see how Jesus did it. And if you do, the God of peace will be with you. Thank you for the things that you share. You've said so many profound things. Listeners, as you know, I always do a tools and tips show where we highlight all this great information. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this down to 10. I'm going to try to get this down to 10 tips, but if not, you can always come back and re-listen because it was a lot of insightful information. So, Sindhu, thank you for your time today. I'll see you guys next week for our wonderful recap. Thank you.